There we go. Thank you, Bronwyn. Um, can people see the uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, first, I want to say that, well, I'm very honored to be here, but, and I thought that the uh, two sessions this morning were just fabulous. So, uh, frankly, I think being out from under the yoke of SAMHSA is, you know, maybe a good thing. Uh, and hopefully these action groups will uh, help, you know, get us uh, more organization and maybe back to where, you know, things were in, in the 70s and 80s when there was really a lot of uh, uh, organization. Um, I'm going to talk about guardianships. Um, from my perspective and my work, uh, it's a, a kind of a backdoor to uh, psychiatric imprisonment and forced drugging. But I'm going to go through uh, very shortly, hopefully, the um, the basics of them. Um, so there really tend to be two kinds of uh, guardians guardianships. One is over the property, so that's um, you know taking control of people's assets, their money, uh, so they don't have any control over that. Uh, or the person, which is basically uh, putting the person in the status of being a young child where they don't get to make any decisions um, or both. Now, there can be uh, what I was talking about is is a full part guardianship or conservatorship, um, and there can be limited uh, guardianships. Um, but my experience, and I, I can't say I've got great experience, but I pretty I think this is accurate is that they don't even bother uh, with with going to limited par, uh, guardianships, even though those are that's a, re, a legal requirement where possible, which I'll talk about in in uh, in a bit. But um, I wanted to first talk about there's there might be some confusion of over guardianship and conservatorship. I mean, what are they different? Are they the same? When you know when do they come in? And um, basically, it's it varies by state by state by state. So, for example, Alaska, which I think is more typical, is that a conservatorship is for property, you know, a guardianship over the property or uh, taking control of property, and guardianship is for when they take control of the person. Um, but in California, for example, they, they call it a conservatorship for both of them, conservatorship for property, conservatorship for person, and they designate which, which of those it is uh, or whether it's both, which it often is. In New York, it's just the opposite. They have guard, it's called guardianship for both property and person. Um, so when you look at, at people, at, you know how they're supposed to work on paper um they're they're for example it's supposed to be limited you're supposed to have a guardianship and i'm going to just say guardianship now um when it's absolutely necessary and you've tried all other uh you exhausted all other alternatives less uh intrusive or restrictive alternatives um that's what the statutes say Although I have to say, in California, uh, I, I mean, the statute, it, 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 I wouldn't say that the statute says that. I mean, in California, they say you can get a conservatorship over the person if the person is unable to provide properly, you know, what, what the hell does that mean, uh, for his or her personal needs for physical health, food, clothing, or shelter. Um, so that's very loose uh and broad um well that's for the person being over the person and then over property uh you can get the conservatorship over the property if the person is substantially unable to manage his or her own financial resources or resist resist fraud or induce undue influence so that's again that's really loose i mean besides you know what is substantially unable mean um so it's not you know completely unable you know that this put puts the 
person, you know, that the person's finances are at such risk that they're certain, they're certain to be dissipated if the person, you know, if a conservatorship over the property isn't to be uh, granted, which is basically the, the rule in other states, or uh, over the person to provide properly. Well, in most states, it's, you know, that the person is at extreme risk if, uh, if uh, a guardianship is not uh, imposed on the person. Okay, and then the statutes require that the, the ward, that's a person who's under the guardianship, uh, is supposed to include the ward's maximum participation to the extent possible. So that is, well, first, well, that is basically ignored, almost always. I mean, sometimes, I'll talk about this in a little bit. I mean, you know, when family members are involved, maybe that's less true. But when the public guardian gets involved, no. And and uh, that's, uh, and, and things tend to end up in that place. Okay, so because of this recognition that this statutory requirement that the person's participation is you know, is to be included in the decision making to the maximum extent possible is ignored, then there's this big effort to put in the statutes that supported decision making uh, should be, you know, employed. Um, and supported decision making basically is you help the person make the decision. Um, and but the decision rests with the person. But I would say that it's almost it's really a, it's almost not necessary from a statutory standpoint. Uh, what's what's necessary is to enforce people's rights to the maximum participation. So if supported decision making, if that statute gets passed in a particular state and actually happens, then uh, that would be good. But lots of times these. Uh, statutes for rights are enacted and then they're pretty much ignored. Um, I wouldn't say that about with the Americans with Disabilities Act though. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about here on, on standards is that the guardianship is only supposed to last as long as it's necessary. And these are, uh, and this is also uniformly ignored. And so the big problem basically is that these the people's rights are ignored okay so i mean I, i've talked a little bit about what happens in practice i want to talk about a couple of uh, um, specific uh, situations so we know that uh, children you know children are often diagnosed with uh, serious mental illness which never you know ne never happened when you know, 30 years ago, um, and put on drugs, that's another issue. And, but especially foster children, a huge percentage of them are diagnosed with a mental illness and put on these drugs. And then, um, so then, you know, when they turn 18 or 21 or somewhere in there, there sometimes there's a little extension, um, it's called aging out. There's this, this um, assumption that the person that that person needs to be put under a guardianship, and and even parents who have uh, children, you know, and they're all put on. I forget what it is. Is it SSI or something? But the, the, they're all encouraged to create guardianships to quote take care of their children or or so that take care of the foster children. And so these children really never have a chance. I mean, they are, they have, uh, you know, uh, so many of them. I mean, I mean, there are some, you know, great examples of, of foster children who, who've gotten through it and been very successful, but a huge number of them are just have so many strikes against them and so many impediments to uh, succeeding. And this is one of them is that there's this assumption 
that they they never get to actually become an adult in the in the eyes of the law and be able to make their own decisions. It's just awful. And one of the things is that, and I, I get this fairly frequently, do you have a family member, usually a parent whose child has, you know, been diagnosed with serious mental illness and has all these problems and and uh from my perspective, probably a lot of them are due to the so-called treatment that they get, primarily drugs. And they, you know, and so they think they have to become the guardian to, so that they can, when their when their child, or even for an adult, an adult, even even if they weren't before, um, in order to take care of them. And as an initial matter, I advise parents. Don't do it. It sets up the wrong relationship with your child that it makes, you know, there's going to be resentment and and you basically never give the child a chance to be an adult. Um, although, again, I think family members tend to uh, include the, their child in, in decision making. But worse than that is that so often that the guardianship starts out with a well well-meaning uh, family member who d does pretty well. And let's say the family member decides that they don't want to, that they become um, aware that the drugs are causing huge problems. And so they, they want to stop them. And so then the state comes in and says, oh, this person is not being a proper guardian. And they, and they move to have the public guardian uh, or, or similar. Uh, substituted as the guardian, and then, uh, you know, and then that's, well, that's basically terrible, because um, the public guardians uh, are very indifferent, um, and they uh, they don't pay any attention to, generally to what their wards ask for, um, and uh, it, it's just, but anyway, it's an awful situation. And one of the things um, in some states that guardianships or conservatorships in the case of California, which I'm saying now for a specific reason, are used to circumvent uh, commitment and forced drugging, you know, protections. In other words, people for whom, against whom civil commitment uh, proceedings are filed or forced drugging proceedings are filed normally have the right to resist them um, uh, in court. California, for force drugging, I think it's a little bit different. Um, and so then when they have, uh, but if they have a guardian, they got, and the guardian says, well, I consent to the commitment. And I actually like the term psychiatric imprisonment because I think it's a more accurate, that I consent to the commitment. Uh, and then that's considered voluntary because the, the guardian gets the right to decide. They have taken over the rights of the person. Uh oh, I'm almost out of time. Um, so the California, uh, some people may have heard about the California Care Court uh, deal about dealing with the homelessness. And one of the aspects of that is to do exactly that, which is to put homeless people in guardianship so that they can uh, put them into uh, for psychiatric situations. Okay, I just want to mention how bad it can be as uh, when you're a guardian, uh, when you have a guardian, is uh, in the Bill Bigley case, which I write about in the Zyprexa papers, I proved that the drugs would shorten his life. So then the guardian comes in and testifies, we have to look at the quality, quality of his life. Quality of life may even be more important than the quantity. And then the judge uh, granted the petition and said, saying, even if the medication shortens Bigley's lifespan, the court would authorize the administration of the medication because Bigley is not well now and he is getting worse. But so when, when the, guard, the guardian says we have to look at the quality of his life, they didn't care what Bill thought about what he liked better. I mean, it's just atrocious. And the last thing I want to say is that there are uh, I just identified a couple of natural allies, uh, the independent living centers, um, 
uh, uh, are a natural ally. And in fact, Mind Freedom has teamed up with the Roads to Freedom Independent Living Center on the David Italiano situation, uh, which is a Mind Freedom Shield Alert. I don't really have time to go into that. The Center for State Administration Reform is the most um, uh, aggressive, I think, in opposing the whole uh, guardianship regimes around the country. I haven't even talked about the uh, the way that people's money is basically just uh, taken from them and, and given to the guardians. And then the Center for Self-Determination. So I'm going to end with that. And I'm going to put my email address in the chat and a link to where these slides are. And I'm done. Thank you, Jim.